You're listening to Breakdown FM, where ladies don't strip, they ride first class. Can you relate to a sister dope enough to make you holler and scream? What the deal, yo? This is your girl, Queen Latifah, original flavor unit, Jersey's finest. Where else you gonna get the hottest sounds around? Break, 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 break down at them. Yeah. A light shot. David D hanging out with you this afternoon and sitting in front of me is a Bay Area legend, somebody who is responsible for uh, holding up a key part of Bay Area hip hop history. Her name is Tembisa Mshaka. Uh, I known her. Well, a lot of people know her for the work that she's done in the industry for like record labels and BET and things like that. But I know you when you and a whole crew of females, like our first female crew, was something that you were a part of. You know, like we talk about the Mercedes ladies and Salt and Pepper, but you had a serious crew and y'all weren't rapping, but y'all were doing business and promoting and really being responsible for maybe uh, launching quite a few careers here in the Bay Area. So, uh, first of all, congratulations on that. And then also, congratulations on your brand new book, which we're going to talk about, which is called Put Your Dreams First. So, let's talk a little bit about the history. Tembisa Mshaka and her crew of females out of Mills College, which is a legendary school. Talk a little bit about the work that you all were doing back in the 80s and 90s. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, interview with you. Um, Not the first time, but definitely great to be here talking with you about my book. As far as taking it back, rewinding a little bit, Mills College, uh, the Black Women's Collective at Mills, you know, we were activists, basically. Uh, not just to keep the school single sex, but to also bring out the issues of racism and sexism that were going on on the campus and to extend that discussion to the larger community of East Oakland and the greater Bay Area. So one of the things that I did was I did hip hop panels on campus, uh, one dealing with black men and stereotypes, another dealing with diversity in hip hop, and another panel that dealt with females in the game. So those were really where I really got my start in terms of producing events and seminars and that helped me in my work as a rap editor at Gavin and it also helped to bring the Mills community closer with the greater Bay Area community because some people will go to Mills and think well is this a convent is this a mortuary like what is this place you know so for the African-American students on campus particularly myself it was really important that you know we let the greater community know that we were them and that you know the school wasn't going to separate us from them. Now you have some legendary people that have also come out of Mills College and they've gone on to do some big things. Um, do you know some of the people? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Kathleen Cleaver, Elaine Brown, two Black Panthers, and most notably uh, the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, Deborah Lee. Uh, sorry, I'm thinking about BET. Barbara Lee, um, she is just, you know, an incredible, incredible inspiration for me and as a Mills alum Um, you know, means a lot to me personally. Um, I've had the opportunity to meet her very briefly, but I just found out that I'm going to be in the author pavilion at the CBC in the fall, so looking forward to really talking to her one-on-one. She just put out a book herself called Renegade for Peace and Justice, and I'm looking forward to reading that, so... You know, going back and then we'll hit your book. The name of your group was See It Live, right? Was that the name of it? Or? That's the name of my company. Right. Yeah, so See It Live, Inc., we've been in business since 1994, and we had a number of things going on. We were developing artists, managing artists. I managed Mystic. I was her first manager. I also worked with Micah Montgomery, who now is an independent R&B artist. She used to be a member of the group Image. She has a new album out right now that's amazing. And we also did street marketing and promotion through retail and radio. Uh, We worked with some of the labels like Death Row, Ruthless. Um, When Scarface was signed to Virgin, you know, he wanted uh, street teams in the Bay Area that would help keep him rooted to the community. So we worked with New Tribe as well. You know, I bring this up because I think it's important when we talk about 
stuff that comes out the bay. And we often hear the story, you know, every city has its template, and ours is two shorts sold, records out the back of his car, yes. and E-40 did the same, and then the Bay Area, now right? <laughs> you're doing it, well, you're doing it now with books, but more importantly, you know, it talks about this hustling ethic that comes out of this area. And I think when we talk about women in the business, we often forget, um, you know, that, that you all hustled. But the hustling, unfortunately, and you can speak on this, seems to be narrow-casted to, like, hustling to get in the video. I've never seen you in a video unless you was running it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and that's really where the genesis of the book concept came from was that, you know, so often we're stereotyped as groupies or gold diggers. You know, when we're on a set, nobody thinks about us possibly being producers or directors. You know, they think of us first as extras or, you know, interns or something like that. And, you know, being an intern is not such a bad thing, but when you start talking about, oh, well, you must be going to change clothes later so you can writhe around in this video, you know, my book, the whole point to that was to just show that there's so much more business that women are engaged in and we're not just in it you know trying to use our bodies as all access passes to be in the game so you know I first and foremost have been a business person really looking to connect other people with folks to help them you know benefit their careers you know to help make people aware of great artists to help discover new talent and you know I never wanted to be out front because not everybody's supposed to be on camera or on stage and I understood that my thing was I'm going to contribute to hip hop as a writer you know of all the elements that's where I plug in I'm a writer so you know I've been contributing that way behind the scenes and been totally happy with that from the Gavin columns the seminars to the Sony music campaigns that I did and now you know being able to bring that information full circle for people to read is great you were one of the first female editors, at least for the rap session of Gavin, right? Yep, I was the only female, the only African American to hold the position, and I actually held it longer than all of my predecessors combined. So, you know, much love to Brian and Kelly, but uh, I did my thing for a solid five years. I'm hip hop, crop, bouncing, counting slave trades. But who got it made or who got made and not paid? I'm talking about taxes, fees, dues, and debts. You'll be scandal. Life is a gamble. You better bet. And better yet, don't forget your family, friends, and kin. And I express this adamantly. And that's why. I gotta take care of my own. I gotta know right from wrong. I gotta keep my peace in mind. Your book, 
um, put your dreams first, handle your entertainment business. Um, is this a how-to, is this a fiction, or is this something that is um, targeting women and bringing a certain type of, I don't know, angle that women would be reading and say, yeah, she put it down for us. Absolutely. It's not the girl's guide to the entertainment industry by any means. That's why it's not on the cover. But I did want to focus it on women. Having come up, you know, out of an all female educational environment, I understood how important it was to provide leadership as a female. And so I'm doing this with this book by gathering 90 different women across every area. So it's not just for performers. We deal with new media, we deal with music, television, film, fashion imaging, marketing. I even have audio engineers and attorneys in here who are female in the business and I definitely want men to read it too because it will help them to see how they occur in the business and how and when they're practicing sexism or bias and hopefully it'll help to change some minds in the process. Usually when we have uh, conversations with women um, who are in the industry or in any number of professions, um, it gets reduced down to, you know, how do you survive as a woman, you know, the sexism and unequal pay and those things. And, and I don't want to diminish those because I, I think they're probably still a challenge. Um, but one, if you address that, is there a new millennium approach to solving that problem? Um, you know, different type of angle that you take with it. And two, are there some other particular challenges that that are often overlooked when we talk about you know how you all are you know as women are dealing with this thing um, you know whether it's especially in the music industry that often goes swept under the rug or just unnoticed and for folks who are just tuning in we're talking with Timbisa and Shaka a long time uh, I'm gonna call her a, a, a landmark you know in Bay Area hip-hop um, she has a book out and that's what we are celebrating um, with her this week as she is making her rounds. So talk talk to us about those two questions. Well, I think that one of the critical issues is pay inequity. And that sort of has this ripple effect in terms of us having to do more as we hustle. You know, being earners of 77 cents on every male dollar means that we have to do more with less and it means that we have to work harder to get to that you know that parity level so I think that that's one of the one of the critical issues facing us in terms of how to surmount that you know we're getting closer with the Obama administration signing the Lilly Led Better Act and you know understanding the ripple effect that it has on health care on child care and etc but in terms of how to how to navigate the business one of the things that a lot of the women said they needed 80 percent of my respondents when I did my empirical data said they were missing a mentor so you know mentorship is a really important piece and it's something that I hope to provide you know as mentorship in a bottle with this book but that's definitely one thing that women can do to you know really propel themselves in the business is to align themselves with a mentor are we talking about a female mentor we're we talking about a male mentor and I'm asking that from the standpoint of one of the stereotypes that women get labeled with is that y'all can't get along with each other. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think that this is going to break through that stereotype. I think you'll really see how collaborative women are and how often, you know, they rely upon each other. But as far as I'm concerned, the mentor really needs to be aligned with the things you want to achieve in business. So if they're male, but they understand where it is you're trying to go and they have experience in that area, great. If they're female and it's unrelated, but you guys have sort of a, a kinship and there's some some you know whether it's generational or career related there's some type of synergy that's great too um, I think fundamentally you want to find somebody who can help you get to where you want to go you know talking about mentors um, can you give us one or two um, examples of good mentors that you might have highlighted in this book and also you know going back to the see it live days where you had all those women that were rolling with you from crystal isaacs to you know ingrid best you know a lot of folks who went on to do big things in the industry themselves how did you all you know keep egos in check and really um you know hold it down as a crew well they had keeping a real promotion so you know they also were in the same business that see it live was in and you know you you think of us as a crew and we very much much were even though we were in the same business there was enough work to go around for all of us to be successful so you know 
we held each other down and really just let one another know when they needed information or when something wasn't working, you know, trying to help them push through. We did that for each other. I didn't realize you all were two different yeah, things. Yeah, absolutely. But we were so tight yeah. and we sort of rolled as one because that unity really does strengthen us as women and it helps us to be able to achieve our goals. You know, if everybody thinks that we're down with each other, then they're not going to try to play us against each other. You know, usually that's a tactic that's used mm-hmm. um, to play people off each other and I was told by a business person um, that you're supposed to do that, create that sort of tension in the workplace or in business arenas to get the best out of people. If I play see it live against your your homies and keep it real, then it means you're all going to do the extra work and go the extra yard because, uh, you know, you want to you wanna get the, uh, you know, the full benefit. Well, I think that we have to be careful about that. You know, we need to push people and drive people to be better, but not necessarily to the detriment of other business people. You know, I think that ethic will serve the person who's, you know, trying to create that tension. But ultimately, you know, those are relationships that they could have nurtured between the two respective organizations, for example. So, you know, I really look in this book to try to share ways of doing business that don't compromise one's integrity, you know, or one's values. And I hope that, you know, it does its job in terms of letting women know that they don't have to go that route in order to be successful. Name a couple of highlighted, you know, highlight a couple of people in the book that you focus on that we really need to pay attention to either 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 as mentors or just for the type of things that they have accomplished. Well, there are some familiar names in the book, but I definitely didn't want to focus on people who are in the public eye, but some of those people are Vanessa Williams who wrote the foreword to the book, Les Nubien, uh, Monique the comedian who just won a dramatic acting award at Sundance for her role in Precious, Lisa Cortez who is the producer of that film who works with Lee Daniels. Uh, Kathy Hughes is also in the book, the founder of Radio 1 and TV 1. But there are a number of women in this book that people may not have heard of or they may have just heard of recently, uh, like Tina Davis, the manager of Chris Brown. She's in two chapters in this book. And you really do get um, an introduction to her from her own words. Uh, there's a woman named Miss Lago, who is an engineer for Timbaland. She works with everyone from Britney Spears to Nelly Furtado, and she's an incredible engineer. Carrie Hilson, she's working with her as well. And there are people in this book who drive the culture, who drive the industry, but you never hear about them because there's so much focus on male moguls. You know, um, one of the things that I find is a challenge is that when you have women that are in positions of power, say somebody like Kathy Hughes, there would be an expectation, at least I have one, that whatever is lacking because of male leadership, maybe not enough women being presented or certain type of sensitivity towards issues and what have you, that they would pick up the mantle. And, you know, you being in the thick of things in the industry first, did you feel that pressure? Um, Were you able to accommodate that and fill that void or those expectations? And how do we deal with either critiquing or holding accountable those women who probably struggle like a Kathy used to get to where they're at. But then you can look at and say, you're not doing anything different, or at least what I think should be different than your male counterpart. So therefore, you know, do I give you a pass? Do I, you know, look the other way? Or do I come at you just as hard as I would, you know, those males, those males who are, you know, doing things that we feel are wrong? Well, I can't really speak to Kathy's track record in terms of like her employees on a on a gender percentage basis, but one of the things that Kathy Hughes talks about in the book is this notion of preference. You know, she doesn't think that there's an old boy network conspiring to keep everybody out of certain, you know, arenas. She thinks that people do business with people they prefer, and white males are no different, and that it's up to us as females, as African Americans, as Latinos, Filipinos, whatever the case, to prefer ourselves and get out of the self-hatred of doing business with ourselves and help lift one another up as business people and that's what she's done you know with radio one and tv one she's got alfred liggins you know running business with her she's got you know many many african americans employed there and that's the kind of preferential treatment that you see in business all the time but because white males have been in power for so long you know that's who gets the access and so she's helping to turn that tide when does uh, when do we go beyond 
hiring, so to speak, and having the representation to um, having a substantial shift in terms of what we need. Um, you know, in, the corporate side in, in, ter in terms of what, what gets produced and what gets put out there, you know, talking with Michelle Santuoso, mm -hmm. who used to run mm -hmm. KML, sure. um, we had this conversation, like, Michelle, you're in charge of the station, and she was sharing with me the battles that she literally had if she wanted to, like, change the playlist, sure. you know what I mean? And so, you know, you might not have known that until you sit down and talk, like, right. it was, even though she was in charge, it was still somebody else saying, no, no, no. Um, so the same question gets asked in that sense because there would be women that would say we need to have more women centered, more women uh, focused type of presentation, at least in the entertainment industry. And we can now look and see that there are women in some very powerful positions, but the, there's still these same criticisms that we've had, gosh, like the past 15, 20 years. So how does that change? Is it, is it, is it, is it a change in personnel or is it a change in culture or is it, you know, the, the market having to shift? Well, I think it's all those things. What we're dealing with is institutionalized sexism. And so, you know, it's sort of like that whole notion with John McCain and choosing Sarah Palin like you can't just swap out a woman and think that you know Hillary Clinton voters are going to go over to your side because you now have a female running mate like it's that type of thinking that you know is going to have to go away in order for us to understand you know how to really achieve parity as women in business so women in powerful positions makes a difference but we also need government to step in and say, listen, it's not okay for women to earn 77 cents. And that's white females. When you talk about women of color, you're down to 69, 71 cents. It's not okay for that to be unequal when they're in the same position. So as you know, those mores start to be expressed through legislation, I think that we'll start to see you know, an understanding that it's not all right to just kind of let that ride. So it's going to take every level of society you know, making a commitment to equality. Right. And it can't just happen with, you know, one CEO or, you know, one executive or lots of women on a board per se. It's, it's never it's never a point where somebody can just shot call and it just go across the uh, across the playing field, so to speak. And I mean even Kathy Hughes have to answer to shareholders. So, you know, even if you're at the top of the food chain, you're still going to have people that you're going to need to be accountable to. And I think that the key is you know, where are you positioned in terms of your desire to see gender equality, you know, in the workplace so that people who are trying to make careers for themselves can do that without having that, that sort of working against them in terms of the pay and equity being in effect. But I won't fit in your box I know you wanna know But you cannot pick my locks So you a part of me Like New York is to the Bronx And everything is everything We do not need to box Cause I can stick and move I am focused like a soldier And you've been in my way Heavy like a boulder And everybody's scared of death And getting older When you release your fear Come cry on my shoulder Cause Finally the earth's come around Use a new part of your brain Make a new sound All we want is love It's making our heart now The new children are here They are coming out the ground Stop meditating Educating them, their power will abound. Now please just gather round. The pitch is at the mound. Catch my words on clown. You know you like my sound. Now give your girl a pound or a hug with me and down. And with the power of ISIS, I will speak into your third eye. I'll be your soldier in crisis. I will lick your cheek when you cry. And with the power of ISIS, I will speak into your third eye. I'll be your soldier in crisis. I will lick your cheek when you cry. Down at the four rivers, the waters they will heal I will lift my hands up to the sky and make it real My brothers and my sisters, you will see how I feel I will give you a dollar to listen, baby let's make a deal no, you can't buy me, don't even try me In fact, I'll eat your lasso and please untie me I'm done with the cowboys, they do not excite me Don't need your opinion, please don't indict me I won't do your homework, do not assign me The universe will teach you what science is finding Open up your chakra, your aura could be blinding Grab some rose quartz and start reminding And with the power of ISIS, I will speak into your third eye I'll be your soldier in crisis 
Isis I will lick your cheek when you cry And with the power of Isis I will speak to your third eye I'll be your soldier in crisis I will lick your cheek when you cry I am a writing machine and this is my weapon Fighting with my mouth I will be reppin' with all contradictions Stop your suggestin' The righteous do not judge Cause they know it's projectin' and just cause I say it's the age of feminine Doesn't mean that I am not down for a man We all need some yang Get that dick about your head Cause there are mad women who are too masculine And yes, I know that I do not sound Caucasian But sorry, this is how it comes out like the days in My soul is here for some consciousness raising. Stop all your labeling. I'm Kelly, amazing And I'm not concerned with which God you're praising Or what herb you're blazing. Your light shines it's phasing and now the bridge fades in And now the bridge fades in You can light your own way Today could be your day I will be lighting my own way Today is my day With the power of ISIS I will speak to your third eye I will lick your cheek when you cry And with the power of Isis I will speak to your third eye I'll be your soldier in crisis I will lick your cheek when you cry And with the power of Isis I will speak to your third eye I'll be your soldier in crisis I will lick your cheek when you cry And with the power of Isis I will speak to your third eye I'll be your soldier in crisis I will lick your cheek when you cry And with the power of Isis I will speak to your third eye I'll be your soldier in crisis I will lick your cheek when you cry we're talking with Tambisa Mshaka. The name of her book is Put Your uh, Put Your Dreams First. Talk about the title of that. Why did you, you know, I mean, it seems self-explanatory, but is there a deeper meaning behind, you know, what made you choose that title? Yes. there. For me, what I've noticed is that there's a distinction for people between how they earn their income and what dreams and passions they have. And I've been very fortunate in my career to be able to really work my dream job, to write about music, to write about entertainment, to interact with and discover great talent you know they've always been together my dream and my career and so I wanted that for the people who would read this book so the title is put your dreams first because I want people to understand that you actually can earn income doing something that you're passionate about and that you've always dreamed of doing can we do that in this recession <laughs> absolutely I think that this is the time when you say you know it's it's harder than ever to work for the, for the money I'm making I really better like it I better love it I better really care about it and so you know at that point you go you know what I know I need this money to earn these bills right now but I'm also going to commit to doing what I have to do to get to a point where passion and career are aligned do you do you start off and maybe you know shovel doo-doo and you know pay your price like that and then go for the dream job or do you come out the box you know immediately and start going for your dreams well I think you do both. I mean, I don't know about shoveling doo-doo, but I know that being an intern is very important. I know that, you know, starting out as a junior in whatever area you're in, if you have no experience, is critical. You know, this microwave mentality that a lot of people have, you know, give me 30 seconds and I'm going to be piping hot. That's not the reality of how business works and how sustained careers are attained. You have to put in the work. And yes, you're going to have to pay dues no matter what level of career you get to. You know, I've been in the business 17 years Dave we've been working together a very long time but now I'm a first-time author I'm back to ground zero in terms of this area of my work and so it's a learning process for me you know I produced my own tour I came to the West Coast I did 10 days in LA in the Bay Area and literally was going everywhere I could selling books going into stores signing books so they could put the autograph sticker on them to make them sell faster you know having my own quantity of books in case booksellers ran out so on and so forth so at every level of the game you're gonna have to pay dues I don't know about shoveling doo-doo but you definitely have to you know put your time in until you gain experience in a specific area let me explain what I mean by that um, that would be the old adage like when I was going to Cal take this engineering class become an engineer 
but I really wanted to do music. You know, go earn all your money with the engineering degree. Do that for about five, ten years. Then, after you have enough money saved up, then you go kick back and do what you want. Yeah, let me speak to that because a lot of the women in this book uh, were told that they couldn't do whatever it was they wanted to do and that they'd have to go get some advanced degree or whatever the case. Not knocking education at all. I'm a big proponent of that. But they often found themselves circling back to their passion because they were bored to tears or they spent all this money on school only to find themselves unfulfilled. Take Ashaka Givens, for example. She's a fashion designer now, but she started out as a computer systems analyst. And she did that because that's what her family wanted her to do. She was bored to tears. She wound up going to England to learn how to be a tailor and then started designing from there. And she makes her living as a designer. So, you know, at some point it's going to gnaw away at you that you're not doing what you love and you're going to have to circle back to it. So you might as well start out thinking about being the best at it that you can be. I mean, Quincy Jones said to one of the women in my book, Lenora Helm, you know, he was talking he was in a master class that she attended and he said you know the plan b that you want is to be the very best at plan a because at that point you know you're not sort of tra- waiting to fall back on whatever that other thing is that's that bay area so go full-fledged in what you want that's right that's right as we close out you know um two or three chapters that anybody picking this up absolutely need to sit down pay close attention to and if they're paying close attention what is it that you want them to soak up well the first chapter is called getting in everyone always asks me well how do you get in the business so that's why I put that right up front they should definitely you know peep game on that I also did a chapter on new media because I think that's a huge growth area that a lot of people don't realize there are fruitful careers in and they think they have to be computer minded to get into the business but really you need to be good at whatever it is that the internet needs so you can learn you know the hardware learn the systems but you really need to be a great marketer or you need to be a great communicator or you need to be a great writer or a great designer and you can bring those skills to new media and do well another chapter that I have in there also talks about the 10 severance commandments we talked about the recession and how hard it is out here a lot of people losing their jobs being offered packages or you know they find themselves in these situations where they're being harassed and kind of pushed out because you know they need to streamline their operations the 10 severance commandments is something that I wrote to give people an understanding of how to sever ties with a company at you know their best benefit what would what, what would a couple of those uh, points be we're gonna pick our brain right now <laughs> yeah. yes well I mean off the top one of the things that I talk about is you know maintaining your spiritual center and not letting the stresses of the workplace you know be internalized to the point where you start to make yourself sick and then you know you're crying every day and all of that because you need to be as much of a warrior as you can in these um, hostile work environments it's important that you know spiritually you're as right as you can be so that's definitely one of them the other one is that human resources even though they represent the corporation they are not the enemy you want to work with them in order to create the kind of path Package that is beneficial to you because they also have an interest in keeping the company out of trouble so you know a lot of people sort of vilify HR but in most cases they want to work with you because they don't want to get the larger company you know in trouble so there are a couple well you know we appreciate this uh, first of all congratulations on your first book Thanks. putting your dreams first um, you know I'm sure there's a tons of stuff in here you know I, I, I know I'm gonna look at this and soak up a lot of game because uh, Tembisa is one of those people that you learned a lot from anyway you know um, movies um, anything like that for you reality show or something like that <laughs> Well, I would love for this book to be an institution to get to a point where, you know, it's required reading in classes. I would also love for it to be incorporated into some of these reality shows where these people are struggling to become superstars, but they don't really have the basic information. So that would be great for the book to wind up in one of these shows. You know, I don't know about a show for myself, but, you know, I'm open to it. But more importantly, you know, I want people to get the book 
understand that I wrote it just for them and you know if they want to get it it's in stores everywhere you can also hit me up at putyourdreamsfirst.com get it that way I'm on Twitter as putyourdreamsfirst I'm on Facebook you know how we do with the social network and Dave we're going hard so um, I just like the way you just uh, have this hustling thing see this is this is some Bay Area stuff you know I'm sure other people do it but this is typical see like I asked you if you would be in a reality show and you're like Nah, and most of the people around here would say the same thing, but all of a sudden she's like, but you know, what we could do is have this book. All of a sudden, you know, all the contestants got to read a book. In fact, do an assignment around the book. In other words, so you're soaking up the game, you're seeing that they send them to one business, the other business, the third business, on all the reality shows. Why not send them to Tembisa's business? That's the hustle there. That's, that's what we got to get to. Well, thank you so much, Dave. Thanks for having me. And um, if people want to catch up with me, I'm going to be in Philly, May 22nd to the 24th at the Black Writers Conference. You can see all my appearances on PutYourDreamFirst.com. I got a brunch to get to right now. I'm really excited about with NABFEM West. So thanks a lot, man. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, keep up the great work that you do. I really enjoy, you know, having that Bay Area connection, even though I'm all the way out in New York. Keep it real.